Revelation 20 <clears throat> is the millennial uh, reign passage. It's the one that we look at if we were thinking about the eschatology of what's going to happen. That means what's going to happen in the end days. And so thank you for reading that, Gary. That was awesome. I've entitled today's uh, sermon, Peace Time. Um, has anyone heard that phrase, peace time? Do you know what that is? It's a kind of, well, it's a term we use in the, in the everyday life, you know, when we're just walking around. No, it's not. It's to do with what? What is it to do with? <clears throat> when there's no... Right. Peace time. It's a, it's a, a bit of uh, grammar or language that we use when we're talking about wars and battles coming to an end. And maybe uh, the, the end of the Second World War, for example, there was peace time. It was peace time. However, that is just a phrase. OK, is it what God means when he talks about the word peace? Why don't we just turn now into some groups? I want us to answer this question. Turn around, you, uh, groups of four or five, I don't really mind four or five, something like that, three, four, doesn't matter. Turn into your groups, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to quickly say what you think peace actually is, biblical peace. Off you go. What is it? Turn around, have a, have a chat. I'll join in. Right, what is, what is this thing called peace? It's certainly a biblical precedent, uh, principle and um, facet. Would we agree with that? So peace is very much mentioned in the Bible over and over and over and over again, and Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Right? Prince of Peace, that must mean what? I'm going to start with uh, Nikki, because I was in that group, so I'm going to cheat. My group's the best. So we, we know everything. Go on, Nikki. What do you think? Just say that. that. Yeah. Bit. Um, I, I felt that it was um, when God separates believers from the non believers. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. Tessa, what do you think? What did you say? Um, something about maybe, you know, peace without accepting whatever is outside doesn't really matter. Feeling contentment and peace with God and your place in the world. Excellent. And back group over there, what did you have? Agreement and harmony. Agreement and harmony, like unity. Yeah, good. Excellent. That's good. Uh, was that a separate group? You were a separate group. Go for it. What? Oh, yeah. That group, yeah. What did you think? Uh, our group uh, had uh, contentment and uh, right standing with God. Standing with God. Okay, that's a separate issue. Good. That's a separate one. Thank you. Guys, what did you have at the front? And then you guys. Um, Absence of conflict, good. What did you have, Keenan? Okay, so those things removed? Okay, interesting. All right, that's good. That was a good start. Okay, so obviously I've put on here that the world, the world does have a definition of peace. It's a period when, and you can look this up um, like any good uh, you know, preacher you know, would do, go straight onto Google. Yeah, that's what we're doing now. Go on to Google, put in the definition of peacetime, and you'll get a period when a country's not at war. You think, yeah, that sounds right. So no one's getting killed. Yeah, peacetime, baby. Let's chill out and relax. Everything's good. Not necessarily. It just means there's no war. Okay, get that in your head. Biblical peace is actually when Jesus reigns. Even when there is war around us, how can those two things happen at the same time? Well, there's a Bible verse that says, let the peace of Christ rule, so reign, in your hearts, since as members of one body, unity, you are called to peace and be thankful. The way to get to peace, to have peace, is to let the peace of Christ rule in you. And you might be thinking, well, what's the What's the peace of Christ? Okay, I'll get to that in a second. So biblical peace then is a time when Jesus is seated on the throne of any domain. In that area, let's, let's just clarify that. Do we think you can have peace in one part of the world and no peace in another part of the world? Is that practically true? Yes? Can you have peace in one family but not in another family, right? So one family is all peaceful, great, everyone's having a great... Yes, peace is dictated by the dominion that you're in. Thank you, Larger. The domain that you're in, as I've said before. Kingdom means a king of the, dom of the domain that we're talking about. So Jesus can be on the throne of a domain and not on the throne of another domain. Can he? Can you think of any domain that God is not on the throne of right now? Anybody? 
<laughs> he's conquered sin, hasn't he? Definitely defeated sin. But does that mean he's ruling and reigning in everyone? No, he isn't. Because it's optional. Until the end of the world, it's optional. And then at the end of the world, every knee will bow, whether you think you're for God or not, because you will not be able to stand in the presence of God. And then you'll be judged based on what decisions you've made to let Jesus reign or not let Jesus reign in your life. That's why we say he's our king. Because we've said, I'm subjecting myself to you, Lord. I'm bowing down to you. I'm making you king. I'm not actually making Jesus king, am I? He owns the place. But in my heart, where I have authority to decide, I'm choosing to lay down my life and submit to someone else running my life. Do you understand that? Okay. So God's only king of your life if you choose to bow down to him. Does that make sense? All right. So is Jesus on the throne in heaven? Yes. And there is an interesting dynamic from what you said a minute ago, you guys, that I'll bring up about Satan's presence or absence. So let's have a look at it together. In Revelation 12, if you flick there now, you'll see that there is a war in where? Let's have a look, shall we? Verse 7 to 9. Then war broke out in heaven. Not earth, heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon, that's Satan, and his angels fought back. So they'd come that rebellion, and that often happens. There can be a little group of rebellious group somewhere, and they will try and fight back, and they'll try and um, cause problems, undermine things, whatever. And at some point, that has to be confronted, right? But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was held down. That ancient serpent called the devil, so we just get clarity there. It's definitely the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was held down to where? The earth and his angels with him. So certainly he's not in the third heaven. He's not in God's heaven. It's not where Jesus is. He's not able to just freely move around in that heaven space. He is down in the second heaven now and he's the prince of the power of the air in this area. However, Jesus has conquered death and sin, so it's only a matter of time now until God's kingdom, God's king domain, his domain where he's king, spreads to the end of the earth. Does that make sense now? Everyone got that? All right. So, Satan has also lost his place in us. We used to be subject to his domain. Do you remember that? We've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. When you become a Christian, before that, you didn't think it because you thought, I'm, I'm a nice person. But actually, because of your rejection of Jesus, there's only two possible authorities over your life, Jesus or Satan. So Satan's fine. Oh, I'll just leave her alone. She's fine. She thinks she knows it all. That's good. At least she's not following Jesus. And as long as she thinks that, she isn't going to get saved and she's going to be proud, full of herself. He's going, to, he's going to think he's got it all sorted. He'll get to his deathbed and then he'll meet Jesus because he's rejected him all his life. And Jesus will say, away from me, I never knew you. Right? That's what's actually going to happen. So does Satan need to mess up that person's life? Probably not. He's probably going, I'll just leave them alone. They seem happy rejecting Jesus. That's good. Perfect. So you can walk through your life and not have that many problems and think... I'm good. I'm a nice person. I'll go to heaven. It's a deception. It's a lie. The devil allows you to believe that you can get to heaven by being a nice guy. Right? It's simply not true. There is only one way to the Father, and that is through Jesus. All right? So, will there be peacetime on earth when Satan's locked up? What do we think? Yes. Why is that, though? Because Satan's locked up or because something else is happening? God? Yeah, well, God, God will make it so, actually. A bit more than just allow it. He will lock him up. Yeah, that's what he wants to happen for a thousand years. We don't know if that's a literal thousand years, like if it's going to literally start one day and then end, you know, a thousand times, 365 later. 
But it's a thousand, it's a period of time where Jesus is actually on the earth. And Satan is restricted. His influence is restrict, restricted. So let me just clarify then. Let's have a look at Isaiah 52 if you want to see this. 52 verse 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Who proclaim peace. When we are telling other people about Jesus, we're actually proclaiming that there can be peace here. You can have peace. Because God has made us right with him, we can have peace. This is great news for anyone, forever. Who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, that's what we're saying. Just get saved, guys. Just give your life to Jesus. It's all good. He's made it right with God. But he will need to be king of your life. He will need to be lord of your life. Because there's only two king, potential kings and rulers. Who say to Zion, your God reigns. So it's when God reigns. Look at that verse. In context, at the end, the conclusion is we're declaring that where you let God in, where you let him run your life, you will have peace. Where God reigns, there's peace. Let's keep going. Psalm 72, verse 7. If you want to check it out, that's all good. In his days, may the righteous flourish. So in his days, when's his days? So David's prophesying the future. It's when Jesus is in control, on the earth even, probably. May the righteous flourish and peace abound. Peace is only going to abound when Jesus, it's Jesus' days. So we're thinking, well, well, what's his days? What do we mean by his days? We're going to come to that in a minute. And in Revelation 20, we get a really clear idea that there will be a battle and then it will be Jesus' days. He will be on the earth ruling and reigning. So let's have a look at that. Revelation 7 and 8. When the thousand years are over, we see Satan's released again. And they'll go out to, he'll go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog is a, is a prophetic, symbolic language for those nations against God. And to gather them for battle. And in number, they're like the sand of the seashore. Does anyone see any problem with this? So let, let's, let me just rewind. Jesus turns up. Satan gets locked up. Peace abounds. Everything's good. Jesus is here. Satan's not here. And yet, if you get to this verse in verse 8, it says, and in number, those who battle against Jesus will be like the sand on the seashore. How many is that then? Error. Did I get that name right? Yeah. Did I get it right? Hey, that's good, isn't it? <laughs> Teachers pride themselves in remembering names. You know that? It's like Sarah, but it's error. Is that right? Wow. How many is the sand of the seashore, error? Wow. You counted it recently? Yeah, come on. Surely you've sat there and gone, I'm a bit bored. I'll just count the, sea, the sand that's next to me on the beach. It's a lot. Right? There's a lot of people... At the end of the millennial reign, Jesus has been reigning for a thousand years, for a long period of time anyway, and still, and still, at the end of that period of time, there's just one or two people who don't like him. Or, there's a lot of people who still don't like him, who still don't want him to reign. Is that a bit scary, like you think, or a bit kind of confusing? Like if Jesus was here on the earth, surely everyone would follow him, right? Sorry, I just got deja vu. Did anyone else get deja vu? If Jesus was here on the earth, walking around like in person, and we could go and talk to him, everyone would follow him, wouldn't they? Everyone would bow down, oh, Jesus. Is that what happened the first time? No, it is not. No, it isn't. In fact, it wasn't that many, actually, out of the vast numbers of people who, fought, who saw him and heard him and, and got healed by him. There were only a, a select few who really were willing to die for him. I'm going to make my big point in a minute, but let's keep going. Revelation 20, verse 4 to 5. Jesus even has these other beings have died and been and resurrected and come to reign with him again. 
and they reign for a thousand years. And that's exciting. So you think, okay, I don't, don't know how that's going to pan out. Are, like, are actual people going to like physically resurrect? Or is it going to be just a spiritual sense that they're ruling and reigning in the heavens? Possibly. And we just won't necessarily see them, whoever's here. But let's go to Zechariah 14, just to confirm all of this is true and accurate. And just to be sure that people could still rebel against Jesus, even when he's been on the, on the throne of earth for a thousand years. Let's have a look. Zechariah 14. Please have a look at this together. The coming day of the Lord. I don't know what it says in your Bible. In my Bible, it's basically saying it's the day of the Lord's when he arrives back. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken and the houses plundered and the women raped. It does actually say that in the Bible. Now, is God himself bringing those people against himself? No, because a house against itself, divided against itself will fall. God is not he's allowing man to do what they want to do, people to do what they want to do. We talked about that before. He lifts his hand and he allows them to do what they want to do and they attack. And obviously the hope is that everyone knows that's coming and when they're well prepared, they can defend themselves and flee. On that day though, when this war happens, so it's some sort of period of time, his feet, his own feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem. I've been there. I actually stayed in a nice place, oh, nice place there. Didn't we, Elijah? Good, wasn't it? At the top of the Mount of Olives is where we lived for like 11 days. Beautiful place. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two. The Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. It's talking about the same thing as Revelation 20, all the holy ones with him. They will come with him. It's exactly the same. It's talking about the same time period. On that day, so we're still in that end, that time where Jesus has arrived, there shall be no light, cold or frost, and there shall be a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time there shall be light. Some dramatic stuff is going to happen when Jesus actually arrives back on the earth. On that day, so I'm just making a point, a lot is going to happen in one day. So do we think it's one literal day or do we think it's one period of time? Most likely period of time. We don't know for sure. <clears throat> Living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter and the Lord will be king over all the earth. So the reason that there's peace time is because the Lord is king over all the earth. The only true peace is when Jesus is king. Do you understand that? The only true peace that can be anywhere is when Jesus is king in that space. So all this wokeism around we can do it on our own, we don't need God, Let's just be nice to each other. Let's get into treaties. It doesn't work. European Union, it's going to be great. But in the end, we'll start trying to control and manipulate everybody and want our own laws everywhere, but people have national identities and they don't agree. And they end up leaving. Okay, because power is there. It's a great big temptation. So Jesus is not king there, is he? Right, let's go into groups again. You've got two minutes this time, because I think 30 seconds is way too short, wasn't it? Two or three minutes, could you please have a look at this question? Could people still sin if Satan was not on the earth? Is it possible for you to sin if Satan's being bound up and can't even speak to you, can't deceive you, can't do anything? And Jesus was reigning on the earth, so Jesus is now on the earth, he's king. And during that period of time, Satan's not even there. So is it possible? Let's turn our groups quickly. And why do you think? Yes or no? Pretty straightforward. Jesus is here in person. He's extended his kingdom to the ends of the earth. So that means there's Christians everywhere in all areas. But can people still sin even though Satan's not here? What do you think, guys, over here? I'll go with Keenan's group first. Of course. Of course. Confident answer. No, you're wrong. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Uh, let's keep going. What do you think, um, Peter, and why? Um, simply because we've still got the right to choose and to 
we can make wrong choices. Correct. Would everyone agree with that, right? The principle remains. Just because there's Christians everywhere or there's quite a lot of Christians or there's Christians interspersed with all the non-Christians, the, the non-Christians don't have to submit to Jesus. He's not that kind of ruler. He does not bully his way into your life. He's completely different. It says the Pharisees lorded it over their people. But I came to serve. So when Jesus is power, he's all powerful, but his heart is to serve and build us up and love us into a place where we adore him and submit to him. All right? He doesn't make us submit to him. In Revelation, have a look at this. In Revelation, there are many times during all of these plagues where it says they would not repent. Even though there was things going completely crazy, <clears throat> I don't know, there was like some sort of plague or something across the world. Like COVID, I'll, I'll say it. Let's say there's COVID all over the world and everyone's thinking, my goodness, this is getting a bit hectic on this planet. Anyway, it's fine, it's fine. That's what we do. I could think about God, but no, 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 no. I don't want to think about God. I don't want to think about whether I'm going to die and whether I'll meet my maker. I'll just, I'll just resist that thought. And the doctors will save us. That's what people do, don't they? Because they know, they know there's a God and they don't want to acknowledge it. Even in those moments where things are getting hectic, they still will not repent. Did you notice the word would? Not could, would not repent. That's our will. All to do with our will. Let's go further down. Please look at this in your own script, uh, text and scriptures. Zechariah 14, verse 16 to 19. Then the survivors, so there's been a war, there's been a kind of, looks like a physical war, where lots of people have been trying to actually fight against Israel and where Jesus is. and there's actual deaths and stuff going crazy. <clears throat> but then there's survivors, the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord God Almighty, and to celebrate the festival of tabernacles. That means when God is with us. So those things are prophetic signs of that God will be with us in person at some point. That Jewish festival, is what, that's what it meant. If any of the peoples, so hang on, there's a, there's a little statement there. If you just read that, you go, oh, sounds like everyone's going to have to follow Jesus anyway. When he's here, everyone will follow him. Let's read on, shall we? The next verse. If any of the peoples of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, they will have no rain. There's a fairly clear implication that they were meant to go up there and they decided not to. Okay, so if you're thinking about not coming to church next week, you can think again. Might not get no rain. Careful. <laughs> I'm joking. If the Egyptian people do not go up and take part, they will have no rain. So it's only the Egyptians, thankfully. <laughs> oh, phew. So the rest of us, we can all sin and rebel. It's good, isn't it? No, the Egyptians is a symbol, symbolic word referring to all of those who are under a different god, under different rulership, and under a different, uh, with a different desire. So he's not talking about those who are actually serving God. It's talking about those who don't want to serve God and want to serve other gods. Is it still possible to want to serve other gods when Jesus is on the earth? Yes, it is. It's crazy, isn't it? Because you think, surely you've just met Jesus himself. What's wrong with you? He's there in front of you. He's awesome. Bow down to him, love him, respond to him, worship him. And yet they still won't. And when Satan returns, there'll be a whole host of people ready to go, yeah, good, let's, let's smash them up again. Let's take them out once and for all. Armageddon, last moment. Jesus said, actually, that there's no peace for the wicked. Have you heard that? There's no rest for the wicked? The real word is peace, shalom. The actual word in the Hebrew is shalom. Shalom is the word for peace. There is no peace for the wicked. Because why can there be no peace for anyone who's not submitted to Jesus? Because they're not submitted to Jesus. Good, isn't it? Self-answering question. Do you like that? Good, isn't it? They're not submitted to Jesus, so there's no peace. They cannot have peace because they're still at war with God. They are at war. They've declared, well, I will not submit to you. You're not king of my, my life. I'm king of my life, although technically Satan is. 
and you can't run me. But we have the shalom of God, that's in Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, not through our own works, but through accepting Jesus' sacrifice, we do have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So actually, Tess, what you said earlier on is basically spot on. You can have peace with God no matter what's going on around you because you've just submitted to Jesus. The question, though, and I want to think about this, is are we fully submitted to Jesus in every area of our lives? That's a question to be thinking about. And did Jesus come into my life just to bring peace? He said this about coming into the earth. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but I sword. Earlier on, you said about dividing. The sword is about dividing. I came to divide. Make a clear distinction. Are you for me or are you against me? Who's on this side and who's on this side? Right? The sword indicates I'm not getting everyone all to have a big party. I'm saying choose this day who you'll serve. I said that the other day. So Jesus himself is so confronting that when he's right there, you still don't have to submit to him and, you, and half the world probably won't. And while they're saying, this is in 1 Thessalonians 5, while they're saying peace and safety, we've got peace and safety. We can handle this world crisis and this problem. Then destruction will come upon them. So you can, you can dress it up all you like, but if you're not submitted to Jesus, you don't actually have real peace. You have a very temporary agreement. And I was going to put a picture of this, but there's a, there's a program on, um, on uh, Amazon Prime. And on it, one of the characters says that true, uh, she said, basically, it's not peace just because we haven't got war. Because in the hearts of those people, they're ready to war any time they get the chance. You know that? So just because people aren't actually fighting right now, they still hate us. There's no peace between us. And Jesus said, when you go to someone's house and they respond rightly, leave your peace there. That says, that says thank you. Thanks for loving me. Thanks for looking after me. I, I bless you, this, this household. But he says, if they don't, don't leave peace there. Don't pretend that you're in union with people who hate Jesus. You're not. You're trying to care for them, but you're not in agreement with them, are you? They don't follow Jesus and they don't submit to him. Then he's not Lord of their lives. And therefore, it says, don't become get into agreement with those who are not walking with Jesus. Summary then. Jesus simply does not just bring peace to all. Because why can't he, why can't he bring peace to all? We've learned this quickly. What was it? Why can't he make you have peace with him? Because we have free will. We have to choose in. He can't make it. He can't force us. And he's decided that that's how he wants it to be. He wants us to make an actual decision. And real peace is unity with God, his will in our lives, and his people. Did you notice in, uh, in Matthew 5, when you've read that, because probably would have heard this one classic one, Blessed are the peacemakers. Have you heard that one? It doesn't say peacekeepers. The United Nations are peacekeepers. We're meant to be peacemakers. Peacekeepers is going, let's just not fight for a while. Just for a while. Please, please, please. Oh, good, we're doing a good job. We convince them, we con them, we trick them. Okay, we've got peace, we've got peace. Bang, oh, son, I'm going to argue again. Bang, oh, bang, bang, missile. Right? It wasn't peace. That was just a delay. <laughs> War was still all in everyone's hearts. Everyone still wanted to kill each other. They just decided for the benefit of themselves not to fight for that moment. That's not peace. So peacekeeping is not what you're meant to do in your everyday life, guys. Sometimes we can't keep the peace. It says in the Bible, if possible, be at peace with all men. Not everyone is going to honour you and love you and submit to you or you know, support you. Okay, submit to one another. They're not, not everyone's going to do that, and you have to accept that and say, okay, Lord, I can't have peace with this person. Okay, fair enough. I'll try and seek peace with someone else who wants peace with me. To everyone else, there's no peace, no matter how much they pretend they have it. And lastly, we have increasing peace. The fruit of Galatians 5 is, is one of them is peace. That means the more that the Spirit is working in our lives, the more we have peace in us. So let's finish there.
response. Just have a little quick think. Is there any area in my life, could be finances, could be career, it could be friendships, could be entertainment. Just go through them in your mind and think, Lord, is there anything where I'm not really in union with you, I'm not united with you, in agreement with you, and I'm not really letting you call the shots? Because in our group, I think it was our group, someone said about, yeah, it was you, wasn't it? You can have peace in yourself. Your domain is your body and your mind. You are in charge or you're letting Jesus be in charge? Is there any area where you're not actually letting Jesus be in charge? <laughs> Secondly, maybe you've got a different type of a lack of peace, which is where your things are going a bit pear-shaped or a bit stressful and you're worrying about it. What can we do then? We can choose to trust Jesus with the situation. I'll leave us with this verse here. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, that means keep praying, with thanksgiving, so ex expecting God to do something, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all mental understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Okay? So let's have just a minute now. We're going to just have a think uh, for you personally. And for me personally, uh, is there an area of our lives that's not fully trust in Jesus? Or is there an area of our lives where we're in disunity with Jesus and we know it? And we want to say, I'm sorry about that, Lord. Please help me change my mind. Please help me be a bit more obedient, whatever. Let's do that. Yeah. And also, we want to have peace in our bodies as well. So sometimes our bodies are affected by our lack of peace with God on something. Lord, we just want to thank you for your lordship. Thank you that you are king, Lord, over everything, but Lord, not over everyone. And Lord, we just want to say that we want you to be king in every area of our own bodies, minds, spirits, and souls. Lord, we do want that. <laughs> that is our heart's desire. And we know that some of us have got a few issues that are not quite in submission to you. And Lord, I just pray that we can think of those words and those thoughts now. Lord, that we just repent now. And Lord, ask for your help to do your will. Lord, we pray that you bring peace into our hearts on those situations and the ones that we can't control, that you give us peace about them, knowing that we ourselves are trusting you. And Lord, also we pray, Lord, that we would see uh, peace in our relationships with others as well, that you lead us and guide us and who to connect with and who not to connect with. In Jesus' name, we love you, Lord. Amen. Amen.